Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Clarissa Amundsen. Um, I, was, I'm from the, I used to be from the Department of Physics, and I've had the pleasure of ordering the supplies to the light board. <laughs> <laughs> this is Casey Walsh from Physics, and this is Dan Rockwell from Mathematics. All right. Well, uh, thanks for inviting us to come here and talk about uh, the Lightboard Studio. Uh, this was a project that uh, originated uh, with some ideas that I had for creating pre-lecture videos. I went ahead and got a learning innovation grant. At that point, got the grant and realized, oh no, do I really know what I'm doing? At that point, reached out to Dan Rockwell here from the math department because he's got more experience with video recording and making videos. Um, for some other non-academic related stuff that he'd done, and it turned out to a wonderful collaboration, and I would almost say sparked a friendship uh, in, in some sense. Yeah. So, uh, without further ado, lights, camera, learning, building a lightboard studio. That's actually James Gates Jr., a very famous physicist who was visiting uh, last spring. He absolutely loved the lightboard studio and the videos and said that he thinks that this is the, some of the types of technology that's the future of education. So, uh, of course, I gotta put that up there, especially if there's physicists in the room. So uh, why should we use videos? Uh, we sort of know the demographic of this conference is managers of things. So you might need to talk to educators and convince them or, or have some rationale of why you would ever use a video. So there's pros and cons to it. Uh, some pros are you can reuse. So for me, the instructor, you can reuse the videos over and over again. So you get to do, put out effort once and reuse it for you know, maybe a few years, and then you might want to refresh. Um, and for the, for the students, they can rewatch these videos, they can pause, they can rewind, they can play it in double speed. So there's different uh, ways that they can interact with the videos that you just can't do with a person talking like in a lecture situation. And some cons are the students feel like there's more work outside of class. But Casey has a great thing to say here about this, what might feel like additional work, but, but isn't. Yeah, so uh, in the process of this, it's kind of stemmed off of me wanting to flip my classroom, carve out a bunch of space to work on practicing physics in front of experts instead of regurgitating and pushing information one direction. And so I, I carved out space for watching the videos. You know, I'd seen students, they'd come to class, they say everything makes sense, they go out, they try and work on a problem, they can't do anything. What do they have to do? They had to pull open their book, they had to start studying. So all I was trying to do was front load the studying in front. So you've got to carve out space for this, and then you have to have a campaign to show them that you did that so it doesn't just look like extra things, oh, you have to go also watch these extra videos outside of class. Um, the other thing I would say is that I was very surprised at the feedback that I got from students. I was expecting them to say, this is not as good as live, I don't like this, you know, I really want you talking to me as a human in front of me, and, and I didn't get that at all. Uh, they would say typically, yeah, you know, you lose 10% by it not being live in front of you, but the fact that I can pause, fast forward, rewind, watch it over again, especially long derivations in math or in physics, it's really, really useful to have that type of capability. So I just, that's the other thing I wanted to add to it. Um, one of the other cons, though, that we, we have identified is that it's de-emphasizing reading and reading comprehension. And so we're working on a campaign to kind of bring that back into the curriculum, sort of like we gave them their, uh, their junk food because we would get them to actually eat it, but now we're going to sneak in some vegetables on the side. But, you know, I just think it's something to think of if you're talking to, to other educators about going all video. So there's many video types for doing educational videos. Um, and the kinds that we had seen before were the sort of pen and paper with a hand that's viewable and the person's just talking, you don't see their face, or the person standing at a blackboard uh, and you see their back and you see their writing and you hear their voice, or just a PowerPoint with a voiceover. Uh, so you see nothing but the PowerPoint slide and just hear someone talking, or any of those methods with also picture in picture so that you can see the face of the person talking. Um, and all of those are fine, uh, but a light board or learning glass is different. And why it's different is that you get to see the writing and the face of the person talking all in one. So here's a still uh, of Casey writing on the light board, um, and you know, he's talking and all of those things. And, um, we can show you yeah. some, some, little, some little clips. So we show you a little idea what it looks like. So we actually can integrate graphics in real time with our studio. We're going to talk a lot about that. We're, trust me, we're going to talk about the details of what our studio actually has, because I know that that's a lot of stuff you guys might be interested in. 
But here it's like I can interact with this bubble, and here I'm talking about the pretty rainbows and all the colors, and, and uh, this is all because of uh, thin film interference, and then I can write on the board, so I can be interacting with writing on the board while I'm interacting with graphics. Uh, we have some fun, we do some fun movie magic here where I need to get rid of the bubble to make some room. I guess I won't fast forward, it'll happen right here. And so I pop the bubble like that, so that's kind of fun. Uh, I just had a student on the side that just moved to the next slide on a PowerPoint that was the second feed that was just a blank slide, so uh, that's kind of fun. And then what do I do? You know, I use it to go through the physics of thin film interference, why soap bubbles have all of that interest, interesting rainbow pattern. Um, we always like to have fun things, so at the very end, I, uh, I do a little bit of fun. With the audio, it would be a little bit more clear, but I'll try and pretend like, I, like I'm giving you a live presentation. So anyways, I'm, thanks. I'm Casey. Thanks for watching this lightboard video. Ooh, bubbles! Bubbles! Get the bubbles! Get the bubbles, Casey! Ah, ah. That's actually what I say in that video when I do it. Um, so that's an example. We just wanted to show you uh, maybe uh, one more example here. This is uh, Devin Quick in biology. And she does use the board some, but she actually does quite a few videos where she's actually just using the integrated graphics and communicating with them. So she's actually not even really using the board in this particular video. But it's a regular studio. You can integrate with graphics, and you can interact with them and be right there in front of them. So here she's talking about bones. She has a separate student that just has the software that zooms in on the side. And she can sit there and talk about the different parts. They've, of course, storyboarded out. They're going to move through whatever particular parts they're, they're talking about. So I thought that would be a cool demonstration. And I just keep reminding people, even if you're not going to use the board, you still have all the studio there as well, or the equipment that you've got for that um, collected. So we get to see the instructor, the person talking. We, that maintains a relationship with the students. They can be more emotionally invested into this. So if you're using these videos in like a distance learning class, that building of community might be easier to maintain because you're seeing the teacher. You're not just hearing them talk over a PowerPoint or seeing their hands write on a piece of paper. So you get to maintain that relationship. Um, and we used it because we thought it was easy and fairly flexible to do the sort of advanced things that we wanted to do. So we'll talk about our goals later, um, but our goals were to make our effort minimal when it came to the editing uh, after we recorded. It also uh, has that live keying, the grease green screening. And you can, you, know, you can put in slides. PowerPoint is the typical way they do it, but there's cool things with using Prezi, so it looks a little more, more organic. But Prezi is still just like a video going to the next slide and sort of fancy transitions. I've been playing with OneNote, and so uh, obviously it's an example how you could make a Lightboard video interact with material with OneNote so that you're actually able to zoom out, move to other parts, and zoom in. Um, so there's lots of flexibility of how you can actually integrate what graphics that you're going to actually, actually going to use. One of the probably biggest learning hurdles that we had to overcome, uh, and we didn't really know it was going to happen until we started making videos is this whole process of making videos. So I knew a little bit from what my background in video production, but it's an entirely different world when you want to like actually not just tell like a fictional story, but like educate with a video. So when it comes to making a video, planning is really important if you don't want to have to edit after you record. So if you do really great planning and storyboarding, then you can do essentially a one-shot take you don't have to do any cuts and edits. And then once it's recorded, you just encode and send it to you know, YouTube or wherever you're going to post it. So uh, we see planning as being very important. And then there's these other things that are you know, maybe entertainment industry jargon that mixed with educational jargon of you need a hook. You need to get the students interested in the first seven seconds of your video. You don't want your video to be more than 10 minutes long uh, on average. You know? So there's these, these other aspects that we had to uh, learn, or maybe that we knew but actually had to put into practice, um, and we wanted to share those with you. And in this early stage, we realized that consulting with the other educators that wanted to make videos was going to be a necessity, that we have to talk with people before they arrive to the studio so they can come prepared. And we usually have like a planning meeting so that they know how to prepare and what to do, uh, and then they come and they are ready to do things. And we discovered all these different types of videos that people wanted to make. So I wanted to make a video, uh, videos about sort of frequently asked questions in office hours and summative material that normally would only come up in exam reviews, which is a wildly different type of video than what Casey wanted to do. 
Yeah, mine are basically replacements for lecture. Like I said, I flipped my classroom, which means I don't lecture in class. The students come in, a 200-person class, 300-person class. We have like 20 learning assistants. They're all parsed out into groups of three or four, and we're working on problem solving, bringing the group together every five to 10 minutes. Um, but obviously, they need to know something coming in, and this is, the, this is in lieu of the lecture. This is pre-lecture. This is to be familiarized with the material. I've seen some of those words and seen some of those, those figures. Um, so that then we can work on the foundation level in class. But then we also realized uh, Devin quickly made video quizzes with it, which you probably know videos. You watch part of the video and then it pauses, gives you a question. Dan was mentioning the review. We started realizing that you know all of our grad students, most of our undergrads, our professors, they all make talks for their research project. Put a black background on that and come into the Lightboard studio and just give a little five minute talk in front of the camera and now all of a sudden you have something that can brand your research, that can brand your department, can even brand uh, your college. And so we're really excited about maybe making like a YouTube channel for the physics department or maybe for the College of Science altogether and start getting the researchers that that's just part of their plan. I think that there's, it's a new world with media and in this day and age, there is more of a need for that. I know there's a lot of purists that would say, my research should stand for itself. I shouldn't have to advertise and brand and create these types of things. And that, that's well and good. There's probably a number of people who their research does stand for that. But I, I think in the new age, podcast, getting your name out there is important. And this is a nice tool for, for doing that. Um, we've also used it for recruitment, for building uh, videos about our syllabus. Um, for just motivational videos. I've got a bunch of students that are actually working in the Lightboard Studio making videos to motivate the next generation uh, with showing demonstrations or interacting uh, with, with cool demos that we have. Uh, we've used it for outreach as well, where when we have people come in, a bunch of students maybe from the high school come and see a bunch of different labs. They usually finish their tour at the Lightboard Studio, and we make a little quick 10-minute video, and then they ship to their parents, and their parents are like super happy that you know all the things that they did, and they they just draw on the board and talk. Well, we saw a lab with lasers, and then we saw a lab with scary lasers and with friendly lasers. <laughs> so I thought uh, because of this research thing, I've got one more video to show you. This is an example of using the OneNote like I have here with the black background and then the keying effects, the green screening effects. So I can sit here and talk about this material. Um, here I'm like talking about this collaborate stage for a grant uh, um, and I could zoom in on parts. I'm going to do a little movie magic here in a sec right here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now we're going to move over to stage four, the disseminate stage. Um, that actually was done with just a student over on the side moving my OneNote when I did it. We've played around with, and we're really excited we got a Microsoft Connects because it already can see your hands and you can get these little UV lights to put on your fingers so it can really see your fingers. And then there's already ready-made free open source software that can see right clicks, left clicks. So I want to get to the minority report and we're getting close to where I don't even need that student there. I can just stand in front of it, I can go zoom in, move over here, talk about this. And it's, it's, it's seamless, it's really easy. Just make a OneNote file, you have to download the black background because they don't have a default black background. Uh, which helps for the green screen effects. So I'm excited to explore more of that. Uh, I think it's just an idea of how you can go with this. All right. Um, wait a minute. So, I'm supposed to zoom so out now and say, <laughs> our studio, the first stuff was about the pedagogical uh, constraints and desires and the reasons that we have it. Now we're going to talk more about our studio specifically. So. When Casey and I started talking about building this studio, it was after he was awarded the money um, and part of the way through the, the, the uh, purchasing that had been done for, for things. And what I realized when talking with him is he wanted to make 300 videos. That's an insane number. And so the main goal, it's at the top, is to not do anything after you are done recording. As soon as you stop doing recording, we want as the minimal amount of effort to be put out to get that to the students. So the whole goal is to basically remove the need to do major uh, editing after you record. So those were the, that was the main goal. And all of, that, uh, all of the things, that the decisions we made were sort of based on that. The other goals, uh, other big goal we had was we wanted a larger piece of glass to write on. So um, one of the units on our campus, the distance learning unit, eCampus, uh, they, uh, they have a learning glass. It was, I believe, it's something like four foot by four foot which is just not big enough for what we needed to do, what Casey wanted to do, and the ideas that I had. It was just not big enough. We want more real estate to write on. Um, and Casey needed it to be in his office. He needed to, make, he needed to monopolize the time and use this board a lot. 
Um, and because it's in his office, we also needed to build it in a way that's modular. So the, the giant piece of glass is on a frame that has wheels, and it can be moved out of the way. And then there's space to do other things in it. Um, so I think your, your little asterisk here has a little story. Oh, yes, like yes. We have a new world record. It's our only, only our personal record. But <laughs> I had an idea literally in the shower for a video I want to make. And I came in. And from the point I got into my office to the point it was fully uploaded, published on the web, and I could put a link on my website, too, it was one hour. So i give you an idea of the turnaround time. I planned for about 10 minutes while the lights heated up. I recorded it in one take. That took 10 minutes. And then the post-processing, just clipping the front and the end, putting our branding video on the front and uh, exporting it to a video file and then uploading it just happened super, super. So anyways, we broke the world record. Our own. I'm, there's only one data point. OK. Um, there was one other thing here. Uh, yeah, so, so I needed to have access to it often. That was why we built it. Um, it's also why if you have people that want to build something, but maybe they're limited on funds and they want to build it in their office, there's a lot of different scales and how, how much money you want to invest in it. There's people online that have built very, very simple things for 150 bucks, 200 bucks. They use their iPhone to do the video recording, and they use a lamp from their office for the lighting. Doesn't look as good as ours, I don't think. But uh, um, certainly was much cheaper. So there, there's a lot of ranges. We'll talk more about that here in a sec. So I think the main sort of heart of a Lightboard Studio is the Lightboard. And uh, Lightboard is basically a giant chunk of tempered glass, um, extremely see-through. Uh, um, although I will tell you that we've learned that there are imperfections in large chunks of glass that they actually never even knew, the glass company. It's because they've actually never hooked up LEDs the way we do. And it's really amazing. When you look at this big piece of glass and the light isn't on, you're just like, that is the clearest thing. It's like half inch thick, so it's a big, thick, tempered piece of glass. I flip on those LEDs and you see imperfections everywhere in the glass. It's actually that company now has their installers take LEDs with them to put on the side of the glass to like check for imperfections before they install big chunks of glass. But like we said, it's four foot by eight foot. Um, you get about 85% of that on the, the final video feed so you don't get the full because we're like 16 by nine so it's not the exact same aspect ratio. There's a, an LED array that goes around the board, and then the power supply that drives that, um, and a steel frame. So pretty simple idea. Um, I think this is where I was going to talk about the physics of the light board. Which um, you should probably do. I probably should, as the <laughs> physicist in the room. Um, so it, does, it uses this, uh, this, this physical phenomena called total internal refraction. So basically, the light is coming in from the side of the glass and it's bouncing around inside of the glass, not escaping at all. That's the total internal refraction that occurs. Um, it doesn't escape, and you can see that glow around the outside until it gets to the edges. And then you break that plane by writing on it. And when you write on it with a marker, the light starts bouncing around inside the marker material. It's called frustrated total internal refraction. And if it's just a regular marker, it doesn't glow like a neon light. If it's a fluorescing marker, it glows like a neon light in front of you. And it's really fun to write on these things, just like seeing how bright it is when you write on it. So that's my physics lessons for the day. Yeah? So you, you're using UV LEDs, not just white LEDs? They're just white LEDs. They're not yep. UV. I think UV might work. In fact, I have a, a, one of my former grad students. He's building a coffee table in his house that's just whiteboard material. It's not glass. But then he has these LEDs that are UV. Um, all facing it, and so it's like a black light driven uh, little coffee table whiteboard light board thingy. It's really cool. That's your physics for the day. All right. And, and here's our sort of generic physical layout of our space. So you've, you've kind of seen some pictures. This is our main command center area off to the side where the recording happens, and we make our little piano intros and things. Um, but you know, we have um, a camera that's wired right into this video switch. We have a variety of mics that we'll talk about more in the future that goes to an audio mixer. Uh, that all gets merged in the video switch. The video switch sends the video output to the computer where it gets recorded. And um, so you stand to the left of the light board, have it in front of you. The camera looks through the big piece of glass. Um, and it. We'll talk about this also in, in another slide or two. The camera flips the image so the writing isn't backwards. Right? If you write on, on a window and go outside, it, it's backwards. So we've not learned how to write backwards. We're not left-handed. Don't tell your students that. You tell them <laughs> that the hardest part is learning how to write backwards with your left hand. And then throw in a little like fake information. It's actually easier than using your right hand, and they believe you. It's amazing. 
for any of us that know vector calculus, it was hard to talk about the right hand rule because you had to use your left <laughs> hand. And everything that I had ever done to date, I had to reverse. And it was hard. We, I think we literally had to watch yeah. the feed afterwards to make sure that it was right. It, well, yeah, like, yeah. We thought we had done the transformation right. but Yeah. yeah. So don't wear shirts with writing on it, for yeah. instance. Yeah, those will. <laughs> oh, and my wife, you know, it, it does. It flips your face. And so my wife, she cringes when she sees it because she knows my face really well and I'm not perfectly symmetrical. And I, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's exactly what I look like when I look in the mirror because when you look in the mirror, you're used to seeing your face <laughs> flipped, but uh, it freaks her out. So the things that we'll also talk more about in the future, but if you see our key lights, they're off at the side and at a very, very weird angle if you've ever done other video production before. This is to prevent reflection off the glass into the camera. So glare is a battle that you will have with this, because you have a giant four by eight foot reflector looking at your camera. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's something you have to, I, I would even say don't try to plan for it, just adjust once you have everything set up. It's so hard to plan that in advance, you just have to tweak it once you're, you're building it all and have it all set up. If I do remember, we like set it up like this, just like, oh, I think it'll be something like this, we'll work on it. And then we took it all down, tried to do calculations, we're like, we're systematically going to have some students hold the camera. In the end, it was all right back to the original spot that we put everything, yeah. so for the most part. Yeah. So uh, the lighting in the studio, this, this really just gives you a chance to see this is right grow light and left grow light. I'll tell you that in a sec what that is. But those are our main key lights, what I would call the main key bank. They're a bank of eight fluorescent bulbs each. Uh, and they're what do the majority of the lighting. They're what really drives you crazy when you're in front of it with the bright lights uh, in your eyes. Um, you can see the glass, it's here on the left, um, and uh, uh, the next slide I think will let you see the auxiliary lighting we have for the side and, and for the top. That's, that's the main, main lighting. So you can see these other LED lights that we have on the side. We don't have a picture, but there is an LED light um, right above the head of the person, just to provide like that shape. Um, so you probably could tell, well, maybe we didn't point it out, but in those videos we showed you earlier, before we had that overhead lighting, and the person sort of is lost in the black background. So to have that person sort of stick out, we, we put more, uh, another LED above the head, and we've used a polarizing filter. That's not actually to get the light out of the camera. That's to uh, get the TV screen reflection out of the camera. So we have this giant TV screen behind the camera so that you can see but sort of the actual weather map. If you're a meteorologist, you just have a big green screen behind you. We just have a black background. So in order to see the figures that we're interacting with, we need that TV screen so you can see that and interact with those diagrams. Um, so that's what that polarizing filter is for, is to get that TV reflection out of there. Um, and you know, a lesson, I, I, something that I don't think Casey believed me is, it cannot be too bright. <laughs> right? and so I don't know how many of you have done video production stuff before, but more brightness is great, because then you can just, you know, make the depth of field larger. So one of the things you, wanna, you will battle with is having the words and the face of the person in focus. So you need a large depth of field, so you need lots of light, and you need lots and lots and lots of light. So that you have a nice good depth of field so everyone looks in focus, the people, the writing. And then the stuff in the background is not. It's just black right. and you, know, you don't see the little wrinkles in our hanging sheet. Uh, uh, that was also part of that, right. that depth of field. Um, so I, I said I would mention the grow lights thing. This is kind of a funny story. So, you know, we were building it and I was just looking for studio lights, you know, on Amazon or Google and boy, they're, you know, $1,200, $2,200 for these light arrays. And I was like, man, that, that's just, that's more money than we have to work with with this grant. To give you an idea, we did this basically with 10 grand. Um, we got a little bit of money at the end that gave us some toys that we didn't necessarily need, but um, we've used nonetheless. Uh, uh, and <laughs> yeah, so uh, tell it was one of my friends who's done video production. He said, why don't you just check out grow lights and make sure that you get the temperature or the color tone the same the, so that they all match, but then, then also a color tone like you might see in the studio lights. And then the dries drop down to like $400 into our range. So now Amazon thinks that I'm growing lots of probably illegal vegetables in my basement because I get all sorts of advertisements for those. But yeah, well, bro, buying grow lights really saved us some, some quite a bit of money, and I think uh, I don't think anybody could tell the difference in the final production. All right. Camera. So uh, yeah, the camera's also a very important issue. 
Um, I think one of the, the most important things about the, the, the camera is that you want to plan what resolution you're going to go to because it's all starting right there at the camera. We actually originally were like, well, if I'm going to make these, I only want to make them once. In five years when everybody's got like 25K televisions, I don't want them to say, oh, what's this really old, grainy, you know, low-res technology. So we were shooting for 4K. Uh, boy, just, just don't. Like, <laughs> um, you know, obviously costs. Um, and then the, the big issue is going to be the direct to disk with the size and the streams that come through. Um, to do it, you're going to need to raid two solid state drives that are completely fast, and you're going to have to get a camera that, that. So we decided after some trial and error that that really wasn't worth it. And so we, we went for just standard HD, 1080p, 30 frames per second. Um, and, and really needs to have these manual controls. I don't even know what those words mean, so I'm going to let Dan tell you because he's the one that knows that. So you want to dial in all your settings. This is, again, to limit post-production needs. You don't need to do color correction. You can do you know, uh, your own custom white balance. That's not listed here. Custom white balance. Those kinds of manual controls allowed us to not have to do that in software after we record it. So you want to be able to dial in all the settings you possibly can in hardware to, again, decrease that post-production effort, um, which was our big, big goal. So if you have post-production time and effort to use, then you may not need as fancy a camera with all these uh, manual settings. But that was part of our goal, is to minimize that post-production uh, process. And again, back to this, the writing is backwards. Um, a camera that has scan reverse, they're actually quite hard to find cameras that have that feature in them. Um, but that way, you don't have to say shoot through a mirror or mirror it in post-production. So one technique to avoid using post-production is to actually use a mirror like on a 45 degree angle and have the camera pointed this way and then it looks over there. So you would be the people getting recorded, the camera would bounce off the mirror and it would be flipped because of the mirror. Um, so that's another sort of lower tech don't way. Do uh, Just get scan reverse. Yeah, find scan reverse. They exist and usually then it has all the other manual features that you would want as well. And yeah. it's not necessarily just on super expensive cameras too. Actually, we bought two and off the advice of a website, and in the end, I'm going to show you. It's got a lot of information about this. And, and I, we checked the cheaper one, and it had scan reverse. So we assumed the one that was twice as expensive what it was going to be our main camera would. And it didn't, actually. So we ended up having to return it and, and be a little bit careful looking for that. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll say this again, but doing research and planning what you are buying, critically important. All right, so uh, audio, obviously important part of it. Um, we started out with just one lav mic, uh, and, and that, that works great. Um, there was quite a bit of noise at first with that one lav mic, and um, one of the things that we found that really re removed that is that we got a real official rack. We were able to ground it. We got a mixer, grounded the mixer, everything through the digital mixer, and it removed all noise audio, well, uh, all the, the line noise that we were getting. Um, since then, uh, since we've now had more than two people, we bought another lab mic so that, okay, two people could be lab mic, and then we started doing these outreach events where there would be 10 people in front of the camera. So we got two overhead mics, omnidirectional mics. All of them go to the audio mixer first. The audio mixer does all of the merging of them before it gets sent to the TV switch. So you can see we're trying to do as many things as we can upstream before we end up with the downstream so that everything's in the state you want it so that by the time everything gets merged and it's USB right to disk, you're basically done except for clipping and, and moving things around. Anything else you want to add about the audio? Uh, no, no. Okay. It was a nightmare, and then we fixed it with the mixer. It's a <laughs> synopsis, yeah. Here's our very, very high quality studio diagram. <laughs> so just to give you a sort of oh, no. layout there, you, you, the, the audio and the video are captured separately and merged into what we call this magic device, this production TV switch. So you get microphones from the overhead mics and the lav mics into a mixer. You get video from the camera and any video from any other sources, like if you wanted to present some slides or you had um, a diagram or an animation that you wanted to sort of have overlaid on the screen. Th those video feeds and, and the audio from the mixer go into the TV switch, and that's where all the magic happens. That's where uh, everything gets combined and is amazing and fun and cool, and then the computer basically acts as, as a as a recorder. So now you're going to have to do post production. Yes, yes, we are. <laughs> so this is an example of what not to do. Plan and make sure that you have the right adapters before you come. 
into the studio. So yeah, he was talking through what that yep. is. I'll get everybody a chance to look at it. Um, it's very simple. Mics into the audio mixer, um, the feeds from both the camera and any overlay sources. And we just have like two or three different, one HDMI, one mini display port cables that come off of the TV studio. And then people just bring their own laptops in. We say, we say make your own PowerPoints. Here's what you need to do. Black backgrounds. Think about where you're going to place stuff. Um, you know, put just blank slides with just a black background when you just want to be you and be able to write. Um, and, and we let them make those before they come in. Then we just plug them right in. Uh, all that goes to the TV studio switch that takes it to the computer. All right. The most fancy part of the whole thing that is also yeah. the most boring looking thing in the whole thing. In fact, even the image was fuzzy. Uh, uh, it doesn't even have an on light. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the live production switch. I think this is sort of the heart of, of this studio in the sense that it allows us to do the keying, the real-time green screen effects, and allows us to merge all of the feeds into one. It does the encoding right there on the fly, sends it to USB 3.0, right to computer, and then you just write to disk. Comes with the software to control all of the uh, TV studio switch features. Comes with software to do the screen capture. Was about a thousand bucks. You can get one now. The the thousand dollar one that they offer is like twice as cool as the one that we got a year ago. Um, so they've been moving pretty quickly in this realm, seeing that there's a lot of people wanting these sort of on the cheaper end of professional equipment um, to get you some of these capabilities. And we're not even using. 20% of what it can do. There's so much it can do. And, and as we feel like we master certain pieces of it, we start adding on other features it can do. So it can have wonderful you know, titles and overlays, like the NBC logo down in the bottom corner. So we can start to think about adding branding to videos and make them more uh, cohesive and have like a series, uh, have it feel more connected in, from video to video by using those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, the live feed TV. Um, we kind of already mentioned this. this is, so you can see the overlay video. It takes a little bit getting used to because there is a delay. So like you can see the TV, you can see, you can see the final production right there. All the uh, layers have been merged. Everything's right there in front of you, but there's a delay. So I go like this, and then the hand goes up. There's about that much of a delay by the time everything goes through there. So there's a little bit of a learning curve. I've got this figure here, and I'm going to want to interact with it. I want to point to that or that or that. You can watch when you're new to it, or somebody who's just first using it, they're like, and you can see right there, you know, and like they're staring right at the TV, slightly off from the camera, but roughly in the same direction, but it, it helps you at least see what it's gonna look like in the end. It's very tempting though, you end up talking to yourself constantly, and so as you move through the TV, your eyes kind of move back and forth, scanning through the camera <laughs> every once in a while. Um, at first we thought that was a problem, we are like, man, you need to look at the camera, like, right? And I actually don't think it's that big of a deal. Your eyes are not moving that far off. I've had students and I've asked them, they said, oh, I never even noticed that, now I see that you're not exactly looking at the camera, but it, my wife was also like, it kind of looks organic, like it's a crowd of people and you are moving your eyes between who you're actually talking to. So I don't think that's as big of an issue as we thought. That's actually why the little alligator is hanging from the, the camera, because uh, we, were, we were nervous about that, so we just, it was sitting there from the markers that we had bought and we hung it over there and we said, okay, talk to the alligator while you're, while you're, while you're making your videos. Fifty inch, maybe, yeah. Uh, I would say you yeah. don't want to go much smaller than that. Right. And the bigger you go, the more glare issues you're going to get. Um, so it's a reasonable size. And you could play around with placement. I mean, yeah. we we had toyed with putting it like off to the side because then there's no glare if it's completely in a different place. But we liked where it was, and so we dealt with. The glare issue. I, the placement. further off from the camera it gets, the more you really will be talking there while you're trying to find right. the figure to point to right. or to draw around, because we do lots of right. drawing on figures. Right. And there's a, this also talks about some of the direct to disk capture stuff. We just bought a simple laptop. Um, we quickly realized that the standard drive in it wasn't going to be fast enough, so we pulled that and put a solid state drive in it. So one solid state drive does great for, uh, for 1080p. Um, we bought the rack system. I told you there was another grant that gave us some, some other uh, money. Um, 
the, one of the things that got us was a big hard drive array because we were concerned if we were going to be doing 2K or 4K stuff, this is going to add up really, really quickly. Um, we still need lots of space. We fill up our one terabyte uh, solid state drive um, pretty quickly. Um, and so then it gets sent to the, uh, to the array. But um, that's really all you need for direct capture is really just a, a PC or a Mac. Anything like that would work, work yeah. just fine. So all the software is, I think, where we're headed. Yeah. Uh, all the software came with that T television production switch. Um, so you have the like fancy slides and button things that I, I've never used the physical board before, um, but it's supposed to resemble the physical kinds of switchers that, that exist and existed. Um, and there's also in that software some audio mixing capabilities that we don't use but is there, um, and also the software for recording that stream that's coming out of the switch. It's all provided with that. So um, for all of the sort of production, uh, live production needs, the software was provided and works extremely well. Uh, we really like well it. Well enough that when we tried other things, because we were trying to get up to the 4K and right. some other like uncompressed streams, we ended up going back to this software because it was just all there, integrated, ready to work. Yeah. And then the last piece of software is the editing software. Honestly, you could, you could use just about anything. We happen to use Adobe Suite stuff because we had a good site license on campus that gave us a pretty good price. We use Premiere mostly. I use a little bit of Photoshop and Paint. Uh, honestly, I mean, we're just using it to trim the video. Like we were doing noise reduction and some stuff with post-processing of the, the video, but once we nailed down uh, all of those depth of field things and we got the audio mixer that was removing all the line noise, we didn't even need to do any of that stuff. And so it really could be done with Movie Maker or QuickTime or just, just anything that you can splice and move things around. Um, things that we've done, like we, we have our own intro that we created, that was that keyboard and some, some fun graphics. So we've spliced, edited things out. We sped stuff up. That's really fun. Actually, when somebody makes a mistake and you've got to erase, it, it can take a long time to erase on a light board. It's not just a quick swipe. There's a little bit uh, more effort that takes. But we, we, one time, we just kept it recording while she was erasing. She had to erase pretty far back. And then we kept going. She's, I was like, oh, it's still going. It's still recording. She's like, OK, I'll just keep going. And then in post-processing, we just took that sped it up, put some like music behind it. And so it was just, it ended up being really, I think, uh, uh, better actually and to see that. And uh, yeah. she even does this little thing, it's Devin, and she goes, even the best of us make mistakes. And so we stop for a second, they hear, the students get to hear her say that. <laughs> so it was, it, was, uh, it was really nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, anything else about the editing software? It can be very simple. Yeah. All right, so I think that gets through most of what our studio is. I think all we really have left is our final thoughts, uh, where we can talk a little bit about the lessons that we learned. We, we already started talking about glare and that issue, and where do you put your monitors, and where do you put the command center, where are people going to be who are not actually in the, in the, in the frame? Um, originally, we actually had our command center right next to the display TV. So you're like, you're on the board, you're seeing here, your display TV and camera's right there, and right next to it was the command center. But we were getting lots of glare and issues with that, and so we ended up having to move that and play around with, uh, with that. We, we haven't tried Linux, um, but uh, we definitely have used Mac uh, versus PC. I think the reason why most of the equipment inside the studio is PC is because I got the Learning Innovation Grant and I'm a PC guy. If he had got it and then called me on board, it would probably be full of Mac equipment. You know, honestly, I don't think it matters, but there is one thing that does matter, which is definitely making sure that you, that you read and plan about compatibility because there's all kinds of equipment that doesn't work with a Mac or some that doesn't work with a PC at all. It was designed for Mac. And so trying to move through and the interoperability of using these different devices is something that you want to do your best bet first before you actually have the equipment in front of you. Um, we every once in a while have an issue with a Mac being able to be read by the TV studio switch, but we've also every once in a while have an issue with a PC being able to be read by the TV studio switch. Just like I said, the people bring their own laptops for the external video source, and it doesn't always plug and work, but I'd say uh, we've got workarounds for that. Um, yeah, what else? Well, let's see. So, yeah, we abandoned trying to capture high-res video. Uh, we abandoned trying to capture the even the uncompressed 1080p stream because it was just not, we were having audio video sync issues. That was the big problem. Drop frame, just, it, we did, wasted probably 40 hours. No, we learned a lot in about 40 hours of fighting with that stuff. <laughs> and 
And some of the reasons might be that we weren't at the money level to get the highest quality stuff, that we were doing it all in a budget, so we were trying to hack together different things. You know, we just went online and looked at video capture devices. Um, we didn't have a full PC there. We had the laptop, so we weren't going to be able to get video capture PC cards, so they were going to have to be external things. Um, and so then getting those to work. And, and, and surprisingly enough, when we bought these video capture devices, they did not come with software to do the actual recording. And so we were looking at software, and there was like all sorts of stuff that you could buy for 500 to more dollars. And we were like, no, no, no. Is there just an open source? It records. We, we've tried everything. Everybody's going to come up and say, did you try VLC? Did you try this? Uh, that was the yes. 40 hours. Of, <laughs> yes. Uh, it was literally probably tried 25 different recording softwares, and all of them had different weird issues. And, and in the end, there was that, coupled with how large the files were, coupled with having to have like a RAID array, like a striped RAID, just to actually stream it onto the direct disk before you're even talking about storage issues. Um, and, and, and that's when we kind of said, does it really matter that it's 4K or 2K? Like, I, I, I think ultimately we decided it, it doesn't, um, but you know, uh, there was lessons learned along the way, is yeah. the right way to say it. And then we already talked a bit about the audio noise and, and how that switched uh, or was solved by going to a, to a mixer. Yeah. Any other lessons? Some other lessons about how to organize the space, how to uh, share the space with other mm -hmm. colleagues. Because yes, yeah, in my office, but I want it to be used as much as possible. And it's, it's actually my research space. So I'm not in there all the time. My students aren't in there all the time. Um, so there's lots of uh, openings there. So we, we've now kind of got an organic model where you just email me, I pick a time. But we're getting more and more people using it. So we're going to have to get into more organizational schemes and schedules. Um, there's there's been only some three keys. Only, only three keys, yeah, yeah right now, currently <laughs> the to room. the room. Yeah. Um, and then there was lessons about uh, pedagogical concerns and planning, but I think we already covered those. All right, so I think uh, that kind of wraps it up. Um, oh gosh, I, don't, I can't believe I left that picture on the bottom right. Um, this was me playing around with <laughs> integrating with graphics and picking the nose of that uh, face right there. But um, I, we really need to give out some special thanks. Michael Peshkin, if you want to build one of these, you need to go to lightboard.info. We did everything basically off of this guy's stuff. Basically, the story is Michael Peshkin and the guy from UCSD that owns the Learning Glass Company, they sort of co-developed this technology together. Uh, the guy from UCSD, I don't remember his name, the Learning Glass guy, he created a company. They sell these Learning Glass boards. You can get one pre-made. It'll cost you about $10,000 for a four foot by four foot light board. And I'm not talking about any of the recording studio, any of the lights, anything. Literally the board, the stand, and the lights because they have absolutely no competition. We built our four foot by eight foot board uh, uh, for, I think the total price for all that would be 2,000 because it was 1,000 right. for the stand and 1,000 for the glass and the, the LEDs were pretty small, 100 bucks or something with the driver. Um, and so really check out Michael's Peshkins. He shows you how to do it uh, and, and has a lot of stuff. Um, I need to thank Heidi Shellman, the chair of the physics department. She's helped us a lot, the learning innovation grant. Lindsay Biga and Devin Quick have been helping us from, from biology. Um, Drew Olson from eCampus, he's their audio video guy over there. We've actually had a really good healthy relationship with him where we had a problem, we couldn't figure out if it was the noise issue and he came over to give us some advice and he was like blown away at some of the features that we had in our studio that he actually didn't have in his studio, namely the direct to disc and the, uh, the video overlay, the TV studio switch. For their studio, it was great, but they were writing directly to like an SD card. You couldn't even see what you did right after you did it. So you would have to wait till that got shipped to you sometimes weeks later to look at it and say, oh, I need to go in and redo that. I, I messed up somewhere. So uh, that was a big issue. And, and, I, and I, uh, I was glad that he decided that, boy, this was the way to go. And they ended up upgrading their studio. So now their studio has the better TV studio switch than we have. And they've got great stuff going on over there. So it's been a really nice collaboration, learning what they know and learning them learning some stuff that we had found out. Um, and then even I have a friend, Sam Kincaid, who does audio stuff for Intel. And he gave us some advice. He's the one that said, just go get an audio mixer and you'll get rid of that noise. And he was right. If you want to know about our studio more and get some of these slides, um, I, uh, I have my own research site where I'm doing research, boxand.org. I just made a quick public spot, that slash lightboard. You can go there. Um, I actually put an Excel file up there that has all the equipment I bought with links to it. My warning to you is that, the, you know, you all know this, technology moves fast. So like our TV studio switch, now I don't even know if they have that one. They have the new one, it's a thousand bucks, it's the same price, and it's like way better than the one that we 
that we have. So the stuff's moving fast. So like I went off Michael Peshkin's original list of parts and I'd say about half of that changed because new, new stuff, new pricing, new, new whatever. Um, but you can get an idea of a snapshot of mine, which was a year ago. Peshkin's was probably three or four years ago. Get an idea of, of where they're at. So I put that Excel file up there. I put one of my videos up and, and all these slides are, are up there in, in, a, in a form. So you can take a look at that. All right. So what I'd add to yeah. what Casey was just saying is look at our list as a, you need a camera with these features. You want a video switch. You want some lights. And then go find out what is the thing right now. And that was maybe a, a lesson we learned of trying to find exactly what was on the list. Don't look for the exact thing. Look for a, the best match that you can find currently. One more thing, too. <laughs> uh, we meant to get the video, and we didn't. There's a guy, doesn't have a budget. He's a high school teacher. Oh. He went, and he bought the biggest piece of glass he could get at the like used store or whatever. And he bought it because literally the frame, the wooden frame, was kind of wobbly so that he could wobble it, put lights in, wobble it, and then put lights in the other way. He said it cost him like $20 for that piece of glass. He bought the LED driver, and that was like 50, 60 bucks. That's it. He hung it from his basement. He has these directional lamps, you know, like track lighting lamps that he put, that puts on himself. He made a stand for his iPhone, you know, a nice iPhone, uh, and records right through, and you know, it works. It, it, it works. And so, I mean, he built that thing for 150 bucks. There's other people that describe you can buy plexiglass, a giant piece of plexiglass, and use that. Um, definitely those degrade over time. They get scratches slowly and slowly. So I don't know if that's going to last 10 years, but it's certainly probably going to last a couple of years. And, and so I think there's, there's so many ranges. Like I said, we're about $10,000 into ours. I think eCampus probably has 100000 into theirs. You could probably go to another level. Um, and then you can go the other end of the spectrum as well. So don't think that you, you're stuck into one mode. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions yet?